Good afternoon. The topic I, I selected to speak about today, um, I figured we'll touch upon a lot of what's going on in the headlines, um, but feel free to jot down any questions you think of and I'll uh, be very happy to answer them after. Sure. Maybe we can bring these in closer. My mother recently shared with me that on the day I was born, she cried. These weren't tears of joy over the birth of her first daughter. These were actual tears of pain and more so fear, fear that she would not know how to guide her daughter, not know, to ha not know how to navigate her through the same battles she experienced as a woman in defining the boundaries between personal and professional, in defining her priorities with family and personal fulfillment, in defining the compromises that she knew her daughter would inevitably have to face. In other words, my mother was apprehensive about preparing her daughter to fulfill all her roles in life as a first-generation Iranian-American, as a daughter, sister, wife, and mother, as a professional, as a woman, as a human. Someone who is not only living a dual identity, but with identities that are dueling. And for all us women, this is a battle we face throughout life. But as we struggle to define, question, reevaluate, to map out the goals and paths we want to take in life, we watch as parents in Africa grapple with whether to send their young daughters to school for fear that they should be kidnapped or raped by militants as women in Iran bravely took off their hijabs to pose pictures on Facebook, but to then get acid thrown on their faces. As the women of Egypt took to Tahrir Square to show the world that they no longer would accept a male-dominated society, but then were told to go back into the kitchen. As the women of Saudi Arabia fight to do nothing more than to drive and go out alone. And more recently, as ISIS has dominated the headlines, with stories of how they have taken local Yazidi and Kurdish women in Iraq and innocent Syrians to be sold or used as sex slaves. These are the realizations that make one question how frivolously the term war on women is thrown around these days. To talk about birth control, wage gaps, abortion, discrimination, and while these topics are an important part of societal debate and growth, they certainly are not the issues that shape and define this country. As an Iranian-American woman whose family was displaced on the eve of an Islamic revolution in Iran, I'm concerned that these are the issues used in making political points, used in culture wars, used to unfairly and outrageously equate the wrongdoings of our government with that of the countries of the Middle East and North Africa. We're no better than them. We have binders full of women. More than my cultural perspective into the region is the reporting and research I do every single day creating the patchwork for my own binder full of women. Hundreds of real life horrific accounts I have covered talking to the women of Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Egypt, interviewing the young Kurdish Peshmerga fighters in Syria and Iraq, hearing from the young women in Gaza who share their grievances about life under Hamas interviewing the family of Miriam Ebrahim, the Sudanese woman who was imprisoned because of her Christian faith, or writing about Gonsha Gavami, the young British woman jailed in Iran after watching a volleyball game. I can surely tell you, this is the real war on women. The real war on women is about the millions of women throughout the Middle East and the continent of Africa who are forced to undergo genital mutilation. In 2013, 3.6 million women were mutilated in these parts of the world. In Somalia, FGM is at 98%. That means nearly every single woman. The real war on women is about the courageous women of Saudi Arabia who have on numerous occasions stood up against the driving bans, facing arrests and assault, lashings even. It's about Lujain al Hathlul, the 25-year-old arrested while campaigning for the dri driving ban to be eased, and her friend, 33-year-old Mesa al Amudi, who was taken into custody after sticking up for her friend. Both refer to the country's harshest terror courts and held in custody more than 70 days before being released this past week. The real war on women is about the many religious minorities who stand firmly behind their faith and beliefs in Muslim-dominated countries, Christians, Jews, Baha'is, and others, facing minority taxes, imprisonment, persecution. The real war on women is about the intrepid women like Asiya Bibi in Pakistan 
a poor field worker who has been on death row for almost five years after being accused of insulting the Prophet Muhammad. Her real crime? She's a Christian who touched the same bucket of water that Muslims wanted to drink from. They accused her of tainting it. The real war on women is about the women of Iran who cannot dress as they want, dance as they want, attend the schools or obtain the jobs that they want. They cannot file for divorce even from a violent spouse and even if they do, custody of all their children will go to the husband. In the court of law, testimony of two females is equal to one male. Simply put, the value of a woman, half of that of a man. The real war on women is about Rehana Jabari, the 26-year-old Iranian woman who defended herself against the rapist and then was executed after already serving a seven-year sentence. And yet, Rehana was one of the lucky ones. Imagine a world in which a woman hanged for defending against her rapist is considered lucky because there was actually coverage of her case. The world got to hear about her story in an attempt to save her. I interviewed Rehana's mother twice from Iran, once as her daughter was on death row where she begged the international community to speak out and raise awareness about her daughter's case, and again, only two days after her daughter's execution. I want to share with you a few excerpts from my interview with Shole Pakrav on Rehana Jabari's mother. My arms and legs were trembling, she said. I told Rehana, please don't be scared. This must be a mistake. It's impossible, I told her. Rehana, this is impossible. It's illegal. They can't do this. Your case is up for reevaluation, and none of this makes sense. Rehana replied to her mother, my dearest mother, you can rationalize this however you'd like, but they're going to take me to kill me. Her mother continued, just imagine, you wake up one day and they tell you, we will execute you tomorrow. And not even 48 hours after her daughter was hanged, her mother told me, I need your help. I am asking all the countries in the world who defend human rights and women's rights to investigate Rehana's case in international courts. Maybe other courts can prove my daughter's innocence. The government's message to the women of Iran was that you cannot defend yourself in the face of rape or violence or else you'll be executed, she said. Her words continued to echo in my mind. You cannot defend yourself or else you'll be executed. I think about all the cases that don't get media coverage. I think about all the innocent women and others secretly executed in Iran and other places where Sharia law is implemented, even before their families hear about it, let alone the mainstream media. This is the real war on women. And there are a handful of cases that we do hear about. They become sensationalized, they become celebrities, they become iconic, and often rightfully so. Recall the case of Malala Yousafzai, the Pakistani girl who was, sh who was shot point blank in the head for speaking out against the Taliban when she was only 14. You'll undoubtedly remember that she then won the Nobel, Nobel Prize last year at age 16. Malala is indeed iconic, but why is there just one? How about the courageous Malalas that we don't hear about? She's absolutely brave and worthy of celebration, but I assure you, in a world where women are marginalized daily, denied access to education and healthcare, jobs, religion, and all variations of freedom, her story is not the only one. And some might ask, why should Americans care about what goes on in those countries? How about tolerance for other practices, respect for Sharia law, for cultural and religious differences? Well, the answer is that it's not just contained to that part of the world. It's here. It's in Europe. It's in our cities. It's in our places of work. It's in our schools. Tolerance is respectable, but ignorance about these truths is irresponsible. Every year, about 26 women are killed in the U.S. by a relative in the name of family honor. You may have heard about some of these honor crimes. On January 1st, 2008, teenage sisters Amina and Sarah Saeed were shot to death by their own father in Louisville, Texas. It later came to light that these murders were premeditated <clears throat> as honor killings, as retribution for the older sister, rejecting an arranged marriage to a man in Egypt. And both girls had American boyfriends. 
In 2011, an Arizona judge sentenced an Iraqi man to more than 34 years in prison. He ran over his 20-year-old daughter because he claimed she'd become too westernized. Yes, Sharia law is here in the U.S., and this, too, is a war on women. So the first question becomes, why doesn't the media cover more of these stories, both here and abroad? And the second, what can we do to stop it? A few different factors go into media coverage, mainly the news cycle, what's in the headlines for the day, to access to these types of stories, and ability to report on these stories and to give them the proper contextualization. In the case of the real war on women stories, I'd like to believe that there is, in fact, a growing appetite and interest on both sides of the political aisle. But it isn't enough. This isn't a right-left or conservative or liberal issue, mainly because it doesn't have to be, especially in a post-partisan era where finding common ground is the only constructive way forward. Americans on both sides are missing these stories. And for as long as we refuse to see human rights, national security, and counterterrorism and nonpartisan issues, we will all miss the point. As this nation prepares for another presidential election, there is fear that while ISIS, along with many of these other horrific stories, are now dominating the headlines, the right will il illustrate the poor foreign policy record of the left, and the left will push aside these harsh realities with an agenda to portray the right as anti-female and heartless, refusing to help women with abortions and birth control. And maybe it's not because that it's the truth that they believe in, but because they're further exploiting a bigger problem in this country, where young people, popularly referred to as the millennials, are more deeply moved by frivolous topics than by the real ones that will actually shape our future. Education and awareness. Those are our only hopes in continuing to raise profile on these stories of these victims and to do our best to stop these barbaric practices here at home. I want to share a little personal story with you. A little over two months ago, I was honored by the Iranian Women's Organization in Los Angeles. And at the very last hour, I realized that the gala where I would have to go to accept my award was being held at the Beverly Hills Hotel. For those of you who are not familiar, this is a beautiful, iconic hotel on Sunset Boulevard where celebrities gather uh, and symbolic of everything Hollywood, except that it's owned by the Sultan of Brunei, a leader who's imposed Sharia law on his own people. But the fact that Brunei marginalizes and persecutes women, minorities, and homosexuals has not been lost on Los Angeles' Hollywood communities many of whom have publicly boycotted the hotel. Even celebrities such as Jay Leno, Ellen DeGeneres, and John Legend have spoken out and supported the boycott. When I realized the gala's venue, I realized it would be difficult for me to attend, both as somebody who's written about and spoken extensively about Sharia law and human rights, but more so because I had specifically covered the Sultan of Brunei and the boycott of this hotel on air at Fox News. Instead of canceling, I realized this could also be the opportunity to raise awareness and to educate those in attendance about the crimes of these types of regimes. During my acceptance speech, I called out the Sultan of Brunei and saw the unique opportunity of doing so not from the picket line or from a tweet, but from right inside his own hotel. My speech was picked up by many publications, including Fox, The Free Beacon, some Hollywood trade magazines, and even the Huffington Post. But most importantly, I realized my, the effect of, the, of words when I saw the statement by the board of the Iranian Women's Organization, who had held their gala there every single year, promising to change the venue of their event next year. What I've come to learn in my work is that people do care about people. Politics might get in the way and personal agendas may try to deter. But in the end, work, we must work to educate and expose the truth regardless of it, if it's thousands of miles away or right here in our own neighborhoods. I would like to end here by dedicating my comments today to all the women of the world, particularly the ones who have everything to fight for and very little to fight with. Thank you for your time.